Hey, welcome all. Good afternoon. My name is Pim Stolk. I'm a software engineer at Finn, and Finn is a startup and initiative from ING. And hopefully all of you know ING, but ING is one of the largest Dutch bank uh, with a global presence. Our head office is in Amsterdam, and this is also where Finn is located. The cool thing about ING is, well, among a lot of things, also our CEO, Ralph Hamers. He said not too long ago that we want to be a tech company with a banking license. And everything that I do, everything that we do every day, we tend to keep that in mind. And it enables me, enables my team, to talk about our journey and our story. And our story is from ID to production. And that's what I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to explain to you what Finn is and what our journey was. But it all starts with a vision, because you need to understand where you're going and where you're heading to. Fin, Banking of Things, we want to be the global standard for IoT transactions. And to give you a little bit of context or more context for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to show you a short video explaining our product in detail. At ING, we build a great banking app with a lot of features inside. We also have a lot of knowledge on payments and bank cards. Let's combine these two worlds and implement it to a toothbrush, a connected elevator, a connected MRI scanner, or even a connected car. Let's use the example of the car. By adding our solution to a car, the car itself gets very secure. It becomes so secure that the user can register it in his name as its owner. The car can now identify itself. The user adds his credentials. And via the secure connection, the registration is done. Now he officially owns the car. At a certain stage, he needs to charge the car and pay for the electricity. He connects the car. The car identifies itself directly to the charge station, and the charge station uses the safe connection to validate the identification without any interference from the owner. Both parties are registered and the identification is now confirmed. The transaction can now be done and the settlement between the two parties can take place. At that very same moment, the owner of the car could be anywhere. He might be lying on the couch. He gets a notification. In the same interface, the user has an overview on all his connected devices. For us as a bank, we use our core competencies. We add our bank security to smart devices, making them safe so that you can bank with it and even let it pay on your behalf. So I think that is a pretty cool video explaining high over what our product is and what you can do with it. And you might wonder why. Why does ING want to step into the landscape of ING payments? Um, and I'm trying to explain it to you. I don't think I have to explain to you why I IoT is booming. Uh, it's out of the early adoption phase and it's hitting mass market. Estimated is that by 2020 we will have around 20 billion connected devices in the world. And even if this number is a couple of billion off, it's still a ridiculously large number. If we as Finn can get into a fraction of those devices, well, we are on the path of success. And to back that up, when I look at this picture, I see uh, uh, no home of the future. It's an ordinary home. I bet most of you can identify yourselves with the living room, perhaps not the interior, but Take a closer look. You see connected lighting, connected television, connected thermostat. Who here has one of these things in this house at the moment? And not too long ago, a couple summers ago, we were thinking there will be a time um, where these things need to be able to make payments, maybe among each other or to, uh, to third parties. And this is basically where we kick-started Banking of Things. And when I talk about the kickstart of Banking of Things, I would like to take you back a couple summers uh, where we were sitting in the garden, we were discussing this exact thing, and we knew we had to do something with it. And ING allowed us to uh, um, compete in a global competition which is called the ING Innovation Bootcamp, where you can 
enter your uh, enter your innovative ID. Um, you can pitch it. You can work your ass off for six months. What we did, we created prototypes to show uh, globally at ING what we can do, how we can make it work, in what spaces or verticals it could work. We tested it in automotive sectors. We tested it in air quality sectors, and. Basically, the end result is that we won that boot camp. And what that told us, that uh, what it told us was that we were on the right track. We had something uh, that could be a key factor for ING and could lead to massive success. Winning the boot camp also brought us with a humongously big challenge because we could choose now. Are we going to stick to our current job or are we going to branch off, fork away, and start this IT initiative? And that's basically what we did. We joined the ING Innovation Labs. And the ING Innovation Labs helps you grow your product or your startup in a couple of different phases. And those phases are called the PACE methodology. There are five phases. It's the discovery phase, where you just think of a problem that's there. In problem fit, you're going to test if you can uh, solve that problem uh, with the ID that you thought of. And then all the way from solution fit to market fit to scale up where we are right now, you keep uh, in a very iterative form, keep testing if your product is going to solve a real-world problem and if there is a market for that. And it's actually pretty cool. Uh, we started out with a very small team, a uh, very small team of very skilled and talented and passionate people. And I think that's a key factor of uh, our success so far is the people we work with. But PACE allows you to make paper prototypes and whiteboard markups. Well, we are not that company. We are not those guys. So. We write code, we are engineers, most of us, and um, we wanted to get our hands dirty and start building this product because we did six months of validation, six months of testing, and we knew that we were on the right track. So last video, I want to show you guys what we have done so far, and after that, dive into the, the, the different subjects of the video. What you will see here is one of the pilots that we did not too long ago. In order to use this new car wash service without getting out of your car, you first need to download the Fin app. Now create a Fin account. Add the specific car wash to your account. All you have to do is scan the QR code, which is visible on the specific location. Select the car wash product you want. Need a quick clean, or are you going all out? Finally, the user needs to give a mandate to Fin to debit his bank account. To verify the user's bank account, a one cent transaction is made. Ready for action. The smart camera scans the license plate. Now it knows which program is selected and which user needs to be debited. The user can now drive through the car wash whenever he wants. No hassle with payments or administration. A perfect example of how effortless payments will both benefit the user and create efficiency for the car wash operator. Finn is providing an IoT development toolkit to connect smart devices, services, and effortless payments. After the service has been provided, the user gets debited once a month by Finn. Finn will automatically pay out to the different partners involved. This is how Finn technology is now able to create a seamless user experience for car owners and car wash services. So what you've seen here is a not so sexy use case, right? It's just a car going through a car wash, but normally how it works is you get out of your car, you pay a ticket, or you have to talk to some guy and ask uh, for a washing program. But uh, with our software, which I will explain in depth later on, uh, we can turn it all around. And even something like a car wash, which is not techy at all, um, we can make it pay autonomously for us. So let's zoom into this video a little bit. Who did you see and what type of people did you see in this video? For starters, um, there is a maker, some initiator, someone who has the ID, someone who wants to monetize his own IoT project. And that can be an engineer, uh, perhaps like you and me, sitting behind his computer, working in the attic for a while, and thinking, darn, I need to monetize this project today. And with our platform, he can do that. But you do not have to be a techie. Uh, you can also just be that guy around the corner with that cool shop. If you have an ID, and you basically want to make trigger-based payments, you can use our system. All you have to do is sign up in our portal and go to our wizard. And the wizard is where you transform your IDs into monetizable actions. Those actions will then go into our cloud, obviously, and they will be synced one-on-one -on -one to all your IoT devices that you have linked. The peripherals connected to your IoT device, so in case of the video and of the car wash, you saw the camera, the car, and your phone. Those actions will be synced 
will be synced across all of these devices, allowing you uh, to do autonomous payments in a very easy way. But we don't stop there because we know we also need suppliers. The car was planned, the whole company, um, Leus Car was gave his car washing plant as a service to our maker. He basically said, okay, I have my existing business, it's working fine for me, but if you think you can do it better or smarter in a more innovative way, be my guest. All we have to do is onboard any type of supplier to our platform. Hey. That hardly ever happens. Gosh darn. Yeah, I think we're back. Yeah, sorry about that, don't know what happened. So all we have to do is onboard that supplier in a portal and link it to a maker. And it can be that a maker has many suppliers. The supplier have to uh, activate his service saying, hey, uh, you can have a washing program X, Y and Z, they cost that, that and that, and any maker can just use them, put some money on top of them and offer it on our platform. All of this would obviously be irrelevant if we don't have end users and they don't all have to look so hip like this guy with the shades on top of his head and the cool, I think it's a Mercedes car. Um, but the point is, this end user is enrolled onto our Fin platform. Uh, we offer it white labeled, so this means you can brand it any way you want it to be. But at the basis of it is Fin, and as long as the user is onboarded in the platform, it can use all the makers and all the suppliers that are also on the platform. Register once and autonomously pay anywhere that you like. This is how our mobile application looks like. Um, as I said, we extracted an SDK from that and anyone can implement it in their own mobile applications. I want to take a couple steps back because it's pretty high level still and I want to talk a little bit about what we have built so far. Um, we started out with nothing. We had to think about what, he, what we need to build. We had to look at the market. We had to look at uh, potential uh, competitors already. And before we knew it, we ended up with a, with a core API. And around that, we have created a, a web portal for, our, for all our makers and all our suppliers. On the top right, you see uh, uh, one IoT SDK because we knew that we want to be on devices. And besides that, we offer open APIs as well. We also know that we want to help you guys kickstart IoT, pro uh, IoT projects and therefore offer different types of SDKs. We decided to go with a mobile first strategy. Uh, so in the lower left, you will see the mobile applications, which you can find in the respectable app stores. Bottom right, that is our PSP. Uh, all our payments we will pro uh, process together with Payvision, which is a company owned by ING as well. But we knew this wasn't enough. We saw the market evolving all the time and we had demands from, or requests from, from customers and, and uh, potential leads. And we heard different types of programming languages that we need to support. So uh, we, grew our, we grew our sets of SDKs to uh, Node.js, Python, C. Uh, we went for a Swift one as well and Android things, we're supporting that at the moment. Enriching the web facing portals uh, to cater to multiple, um, multiple types, of types of verticals, but we were still not there. Uh, we need to have payment processors because all the amounts that the end users generate are being queued. They are not processed in real time unless this is a specific need for the user because most of the time we're dealing with microtransactions, right? It can be one cent, maybe uh, something else can be 10 euros and everything in between. It doesn't always make sense to directly debit uh, an end customer for that amount. So we queue amounts and when it makes sense or when your risk profile runs out, because we know you, we are still a bank, um, then we might run that payment queue, invoice you and slice the funds every way we need to go. So therefore we introduced the FIN payment processor and we're almost there. On the lower left, in green, you will find mobile SDKs. We've noticed that um, we've built a great companion application, but it's not the companion application that you all want to use. If you are a car owner of, for example, a BMW, and BMW adopts S as a standard, you don't want yet another application. So with our mobile SDKs, they can now supercharge their own applications and onboard them to the FIN platform with lightning speed. 
I already told you, um, we are a very, very small team with very talented people and um, the video that you see here is, is pretty cool. Uh, it's not only cool that you see that uh, we develop it, uh, it in a very rapid pace, but it's right about now and I don't know, just in case you've missed it, I made a screenshot. We have external collaborators of people that we do not know. Um, so. What I want to say with that is we are open source, or at least for a large part, we are open source. We think that we can write great code, but I know for sure that together we can write even better code. So we encourage everyone to check out what we're doing. Um, and if you don't like it, send us a pull request and, we'll and if we agree, we will merge it back. And without even asking, we see people doing that already. And for us, that is a tremendously big accomplishment because this means People find us, people look at what we're doing, they like what we're doing, and they want to build upon that. We are on GitHub, freely available, all the IoT SDKs are there. If you want to look at it, be my guest. And if you look at it, what are you looking at? Who knows who this is? Ah. I'll help you out. It's a mobile rocket launcher platform from NASA. And I think it's a great analogy because uh, it pretty much looks like our platform. It doesn't really matter what type of rocket they're going to come up with, uh, that rocket launcher that will shoot it into space. And it's the same with our platform. It doesn't really matter what type of uh, crazy device you're going to come up with. We will be able to run our SDKs on it uh, and monetize your IoT projects for you. OK, of course, Elon is al always one step ahead with re reusable rockets and everything. We're not there, but maybe in the near future. So if you break the platform down one more time, you see the portal, IoT SDKs, mobile SDKs, and companion apps. It's very important to understand that suppliers, we don't want to bother them with anything. They just want to use our platform to sell their things. They use the portals. Makers. Those are our heroes because they create something new and they use the SDKs together with the portals. Everything is useless without end users. So therefore we have companion applications or applications enriched with our SDKs. Open hardware is well, very important to us. Who here are uh, hobby uh, engineers, electronic engineers maybe, perhaps who tinker around in their spare time? I think uh, when you look at your, your desk, you will find ESPs, Raspberry Pis, or Arduinos, or something else. Uh, and we tend to look at all of those things because we want to make sure that you as a tinkerer, you as a hobbyist, uh, can use our things as well. So we like to get our hands dirty, order as much hardware as we can, and see if we can turn it around and make it smart. I already said we have a C SDK, a Node SDK, Python, be just because we can Swift, and I'll explain later why that was the case, and Android things. We are not limited to this. We will also offer everything with open APIs, but this will just help you kickstart your IoT project with our SDKs. Basically, we're providing building blocks, if you like, little building blocks, uh, and you can mix and match what works for you. So to sum it up a little bit about the IoT components, we want to be in your car. We're going to be in your fridge one day, in your lamp, and we are connectivity agnostic. We're going to take whatever is there. If it's Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G, LoRa 1, Bluetooth, it doesn't really matter. We want to be able to communicate across all of these devices. And the reason for that is that um, your lamp might just have a simple protocol like Zigbee or something, and it cannot directly talk to, uh, to the internet or to our backends or to our systems. So therefore, we create something which we would like to call, call bot talk. We're going to make the devices talk to each other. If your lamp, for whatever reason, needs to order a new shade of pink because Christmas is coming up and uh, some maker has decided that you can buy that in some app store, it needs to be able to talk to your fridge who in then in his place can talk to your car and can deliver that message to our core backend and make sure that you will have the right shade of pink uh, in your Philips U lights, for example. And to, uh, and to follow up on that fridge example that will happen in the near future, um, it's not a crazy idea, right? We've been talking about that for years. At some moment in time, if you have a party and you run out of beer or wine, it would be great if that fridge orders new, uh, new beer and wine for you. And we will not be the company that will make that. We will not be the company that will interface with, for example, Albert Heijn. 
that's most likely a partnership between LG or Samsung and, and Albert Heijn or Jumbo. Now, we will be that company that facilitates that payment in a very easy way. We will be, we will, we will be that company um, that asks the mandate to you as an end user, uh, help you to set limits for your fridge, not to order too much alcohol or too much uh, healthy stuff. So, um, with that in mind, uh, we did a lot of pilots, and I can talk about those pilots forever, and we're not going to do that, but I just want to highlight a couple of them. And um, the first one is a very interesting one. It's a pilot that we've done with a small company in Haarlem, which is called Fair Air, and this guy basically uh, was selling uh, filter boxes, uh, filters for filter boxes that we have in our houses. It purifies the air, and that was all he did. He waited for, uh, for a request to come into his web shop, and he would ship the filters. It's, again, not a very sexy thing, but it's a very cool thing because what we could do is we could change this business model. Instead of just selling filters, we could sell clean air now. We made very small um, air quality detectors that we put inside people's home, measured the air quality over time, and if we detected that the air quality went down, we communicated with the air filter box, make it run a little bit faster. If the air quality didn't uh, increase or went be um, uh, got better, we could calculate that the filters would be saturated and therefore already order new filters before you as an end user or a homeowner uh, would even know. So it would mean literally that you would come home one day and those filters would be right there on the door map and all you had to do was put them in, basically a little note on top of them saying, um, we're sending you clean air, now put them in your filter box. Great example how we changed the business model of the company. Something else, uh, a car is basically an IoT device on wheels. It's a car is a, a computer on steroids. There's so many different types of sensors and so many different types of uh, cool interfaces in there that we felt like uh, we have to do something with that. We partnered up with a ridiculously large uh, German car manufacturer, which I cannot name, um, and did a couple of pilots. And one of the pilots is actually uh, driving over toll roads. So. We are a software company, we do not create hardware, yet we tend to play a lot with hardware to make sure that everything runs. But in the basics, we are a software company and we provide SDKs. Adding hardware to a car is difficult uh, and is a lengthy process. So what we did is we installed our SDK into the head unit of the car. And the objective was, if the car is going towards a toll road near the German-Austrian border, it has to pay for my toll ticket in advance and the toll booth uh, better be open if I come come driving uh, towards that because I don't know maybe from holidays we all know those annoyingly long queues we have to pay with your credit card well now they have uh, a video mount which is all the way in the left a video mount lane uh, you can buy a subscription up front if you like uh, a yearly pass or a weekly pass and then you can also do that but we don't like subscriptions we want to pay per use so we change that if the car drives towards the, the border and uh, two things happen, or, or one of the two things happen, the navigation tells you uh, that you're going to pass that toll road, or um, you are already on the toll road uh, and you cannot take an exit anymore, the car will buy a ticket for you. It will identify it on the head unit, just sell, telling you quick heads up from, hey, I got the video, uh, I got the pass, you can speed through and you can go. Um, and that works, and that's great, because now we are in the car, we can pay for things that happen at the moment, uh, happen at a specific moment, uh, which are toll roads. But if we just think a little bit further on, and it's really not far-fetched, we can also now pay for charging, parking, um, fuel perhaps. All of these things are in reach. A little bit closer to home, we partnered up with, um, with a very small company, but a very cool company called Olivery. And um, apparently in some homes, uh, Olive oil is like a religion in the kitchen, and when you run out, it's panic. Um, so therefore, they have decided that they want a smart olive oil bottle. And they took an ordinary bottle, just like this one, and what they did is they add a little scale at the bottom. Um, and it's not a real scale that measures the amount of oil or the weight in it, no, it, me it measures uh, the wobbly effect. If you put a bottle down, the fluid inside will wobble for a bit. Somehow they can measure that and they can detect how much oil is in there. If the oil is about to run out, an action is triggered, we deliver new oil at your doorstep. And it's actually super cool because they have um, like a, it, it, it looks like a DVD box, basically hard plastic and the olive oil is inside, so you can put it through the letter box and you don't have to pick it up at your neighbors. It's a very cool example on 
how we changed something which is uh, uh, very old school basically into a, well, a high tech bottle. But those are business to business examples. And um, although there are many to talk about, uh, um, I think there's a different aspect that I would like to, uh, like to talk about. And that's the community because we, we do B2B, but we also do B2C or well B2D as we would like to call it business to developer, us. In that community, uh, we do a lot of, or with our community, we do a lot of workshops. Um, we invite people to our office or we rent a space somewhere and we just start hacking together about uh, with their product, with our SDKs and see, see where we're going. We do a lot of meetups and we, we talk about our use cases and we talk about use cases that you guys might have and how they would fit into our platform because we are... Um, beyond banking horizon free initiative and this means that um, in two to five years from now uh, our vision must be realized but it is also an immediate problem today for us because some of the use cases are so far-fetched that we cannot really uh, explain them that well and that's why we would like to work together with our community and talk about problems today so that community that is driven by makers uh, IoT enthusiasts, uh, professional engineers, it doesn't really matter. Anyone who has an idea about IoT, how you want to change something around, can join our community and talk with us about it. And I think the coolest example that I've seen is um, uh, actually from this guy, his name is uh, Stani. I don't know if it's his nickname, nickname or his real name. Uh, one day I was browsing through the logs, it's really GDPR compliant, and uh, I saw cat food ordered, uh, cat was eating, and I figured, couldn't make heads or tails of, of it. And I was like, what's going on? So uh, we got into contact with Stani through Slack and asked uh, what he was building. And he was explaining to us that he has a uh, automated cat food dispenser because he travels a lot or something or works long days. But he didn't really know if his cat was eating. And uh, because it was automated, he didn't know when he needed to order new food. So he equipped it with a couple of sensors. And now every time his cats eat, he gets a push notification. But every, I believe it's 50 times uh, that this cat uh, ate, the thing will order new food for the cat itself. And I thought that was a pretty cool thing to build. We would have never thought about that. But he took, well, a, a, a minor real life problem and, and changed it into something super cool. And what we see with that community is um, growth. And it's not about the graph, but it's about the trend line. We see the growth uh, increasing every day. We see more usage on our platform. We see more makers, more suppliers, more end users using the different types of features that are already out there. And I think that's something super cool that we achieve with such a small team in such a small, uh, such a small time span. But it didn't always go uh, super smooth. We had a lot of challenges, and I think it's very important to highlight some of the challenges. We are working on this product now for almost two years. When we started out, um, we started with a, well, with a clean whiteboard, no code at all. We could hit file new project. How cool is that? I mean, I've been working as an engineer for many, many years. I've worked at mobile banking for um, six years. Well, I was very lucky that I could also dare in the beginning to file new project and start ING mobile banking from scratch. And I took all those lessons learned into this project, but there were so many, and it also got me, uh, gave me a little bit of a uh, um, weird feeling that you can do it all over again, but don't make the same mistakes. Because file new project, what kind of language are you going to write your project in anyways? I decided that we're going to write our project in Swift, and we're going to write Swift on the back end. And I don't know if many of you know what that means, but um, in my company, no one knows what that means, because it was something new, something far-fetched, something you shouldn't do. Backend, that's Java. We live in a Java world. ING is built up on Java. And now here comes this guy telling me that we're going to write Swift on the backend. So I had to explain to everyone that uh, I fell in love with this combination. Swift and Kitura is uh, are a powerful combination for us. I can talk to you about why it's so, why it's so performing or that it used less memory than Java last year. Or I can talk about uh, developer happiness index, how it made me so happy that I could do that. But those were not my main motivations. Actually, I didn't think about those things at all because my real motivation was speed, time to market. I only had three months in the beginning to prove uh, that what we were doing is the right thing to do. And by doing something different, a bold move, a different move, writing Swift on the back end, uh, I could gain traction and I could gain speed because I come from a mobile background, as I already said. Some of the team members also did the same. And 
we wanted to reuse code, as much code as possible. And you can see that throughout all of our IoT SDKs as well. Um, same naming conventions, same code, reuse code components, don't write something twice, reuse it as often as you can. We fell in love with this idea, and that's basically what we're doing everywhere. Another thing, and I think it's a little bit of an elephant in the room, I heard it multiple times at the conference as well, uh, microservices. Um, file new project, clean slate, are you going to start directly with microservices, yes or no? Well, the answer for us is no. Uh, we started with a very monolithic approach, and we all know that at some moment in time, maybe not too far from now, we have to split it up into different types of services. But we don't know when. Uh, you have to find that sweet spot, and maybe that sweet spot will never happen, and you have to force it a bit, but um, we've built our platform uh, with microservices in mind, and we know that we have to go there one day, and we will be ready for it. Containerize everything. I think that's a big lesson learned. Um, when we started out, we were on the IBM cloud, which was great. Um, working at a very large enterprise, we had to get a lot of risk approvals to do so, and we failed to do so, so we went to AWS. Different story. But long story short, after a couple of weeks, we had to move cloud again, and we went to Azure. What I'm trying to say is, if you move clouds a lot, you better have containerized your entire platform, because it makes it so much easier to, um, to move between, between different types of clouds. And even if you want to run it in your own private cloud one day, you better have it in a Docker container, orchestrated by Kubernetes or something else, because it will help you in the long term. Even though it, in the beginning, might look like a lot of overhead, I encourage you to start out with it. The paradigm shift, I think that was one of the biggest challenges that we faced. From a mobile developer, um, I immediately became a full-stack engineer again. I was writing mobile application, IoT SDKs in Swift, and also the backend suddenly. So uh, I really had to change my mindset again, and uh, I had to convince a lot of people that uh, what we were doing, I what we were doing, was the right thing to do. So suddenly I was an engineer, front-end, back-end, IoT, and I had to convince my co uh, my company that it was the right thing. And the question that I always got. Man, is your thing production ready? Because it runs in production doesn't mean it's production ready. And it's very difficult to, um, to answer that question with, with hard numbers. But being live for almost uh, half a year now, uh, we can very clearly say that yes, Swift on the backend is ready for production. Yes, our platform is ready for production. And I think that's more important to say. But because of that bold choice, Swift in the backend, it was also very difficult to find expertise or craftsmanship. I had to find a couple of Swift engineers uh, to help me support myself, uh, which is a challenging thing to do because you have to find a nutcase who wants to stop mobile development and now write Swift in the backend. Together with the rest of the team, the Android developers, the Ops engineers, the Angular guys, um, we picked it up together and, and we're building this thing together now. So craftsmanship, finding the right people, is a very challenging thing. If you have the right team in place, you can do anything. Infrastructure, I think we already briefly touched that subject. Um, you really need to know um, that if you need to move, you can move. Containerize your thing up front, make sure you are ready for data, uh, data migration, and that you have a protocol in place for that. Because we had to find out a couple of lessons the hard way. And the things that bite us the most are uh, our Swift package manager, or uh, Maven might be a more uh, better example for you. SPM is the equivalent of that. They were promising golden mountains, and if I say they, I mean Apple. And it was not true. Uh, I, based I made a lot of assumptions based on SPM. And it turned out, when we were building stuff, that it was not true, and the whole thing fell apart. What I should have done, I should have tested this up front and make sure that what I believe was true was actually true. And we've, we could have gained a, a little bit more speed at the beginning. The other lesson, and I think um, this is the one that's uh, closest to me, is I'm a software engineer. I like to write software. I like to build stuff with talented people, and I'm doing that every day. And these guys also want to write software. Uh, they want to write lines of code. They want to think about it. They are artists. We are all artists. We, write, we don't make a painting. We make code. And together, uh, we make something great. But the community is also making great things. And I don't mean the Finn community, but um, open source developer who make, for example, a, um, a database OEM. And it can be so easy to drag in so many different types of OEM into your project. But if you do that, uh, yes, you might get 
you might gain a little bit of speed in the beginning, but it will also take away a little bit of that creativity from yourself because, yeah, we're doing these things because we like to build stuff, we like to create code, we would like to uh, express ourselves through our IDE and, and, and make cool things. And if you use OEM, you don't always get a chance. So it's a balancing act. When do you drag OEM into your project uh, or when do you get inspired by it and write it yourself? If you drag it in there, you get a lot of different dependencies in your code. Third dependencies from dependencies who have third-party de dependencies and before you know it, you end up with something like this. And well, I work at the bank and we tend to take security very serious um, and we are very strict on third-party dependencies. We need to pen test everything. We need to code scan everything. We want to understand what's going on. And even if it's not a requirement, we still want to know because at the end of the day, we ship something super cool to you guys, uh, but I want to be damn sure uh, that it works the way it works. So looking at this, I cannot see everything. And if I cannot see everything or, or have the overall bigger picture, I think it's time to take a step back and see if we can eliminate a couple of dependencies. So today we are alive and kicking with our platform. We are live and you can go to our platform right now, get inspired by it, maybe use it if you like. We've done many different pilots to prove that what we're doing uh, is the right thing. We have done a closed beta with the community, which is, which is now open, and we got great responses from that. Version 1.0 went live in December, and we are now working towards a version 1.1, uh, uh, which has more features, uh, a bigger platform, and we're scaling it every single way. The near future will bring great things for us, uh, and I hope that you guys uh, will check it out, because so far this thing has been an enormously great ride for us. It's been so much fun working on something that you think of from the beginning to the end. Uh, and you, together with your small team, are in charge of everything. And if we can do it, I'm pretty sure that you guys can also do it. And I hope that at least a little bit or something, maybe one word that I said inspired one of you guys to do a similar or the same thing. And the others, I really hope that you want to contribute. Go to our website, check out our Slack channel, join the community, go to this URL, make things thin, and then maybe together we can take our product to the moon and back and build something great together, guys. Thank you. <laughs>